Good morning. I'm Cal Rastiala, Director of the Burkle Center for International Relations at UCLA, and I'm glad to be able to welcome you back uh, to one of our online book talks. We've done a couple of these. We have a couple more coming up. And uh, today I'm really happy to have Jim Newton, my UCLA colleague, uh, who I'll introduce properly in a moment. But before we do that, just to uh, remind everyone how these work and let you know about a couple of upcoming things. So, so first of all, uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Jim Newton, and Jim will talk for a little bit and then we'll have a conversation and then I will pose questions posed by all of you. And so please use uh, the chat function to put in your questions uh, and then I will uh, sift through those and, and read them to, uh, to Jim and we'll wrap in about an hour. So that's our, that's our basic uh, kind of structure and, and uh, mode of operating. In terms of uh, upcoming talks, before we get into this one, I just want to remind people, you should have seen an email for this if you're on our list, but on June 17th, we're going to have Ben Rhodes, a uh, former uh, Deputy National Security Advisor to President Obama, uh, who recently wrote a piece in The Atlantic on uh, the 9-11 era and the end of the 9-11 era. And so Ben's going to come on and talk about, about that piece, but also about uh, what time we're in and, and uh, how we've transitioned out of uh, the kind of national security framework that's, that's really shaped uh, the last two decades. And then I think our last one, until we take a summer pause, though I guess in this current world, I'm not sure if we need to pause anymore. Uh, Peter Singer of uh, New America, who's one of our partners, uh, has a, a new novel out uh, called Burn In. And it's a novel that also is really a sort of futurist book about uh, warfare and cyber warfare and the changing role of technology uh, in conflict. Uh, it's heavily footnoted and sourced, so it's not your typical novel. Uh, so we're going to have Peter on to do probably a little reading and discussion about that as well on June 24th. So, um, so those are our two upcoming events. For today's talk, uh, Jim's book about Jerry Brown, Man of Tomorrow, The Relentless Life of Jerry Brown, uh, is available really everywhere, but we have partnered with Diesel Books in Brentwood and Del Mar uh, as a kind of local bookstore partner, and uh, they have the book uh, available uh, through purchase, so uh, I think online and in person. So uh, I urge you to do that. And um, with those preliminaries out of the way, let me introduce Jim and turn things over to him in a moment. So, uh, so first of all, Jim Newton is probably known to many of you, if you're longtime Angelinos, uh, as a uh, as an editor, as a reporter, uh, as a news figure at the LA Times for many many years. Um, he currently is at UCLA, where he teaches in our communications department and edits Blueprint Magazine for UCLA uh, out of the Luskin School. And uh, Jim has written several biographies uh, uh, over the years and many other books as well. Um, but uh, I was really struck by this one, and I was glad to be able to get Jim to come on and talk about Jerry Brown. Uh, and let me just say a word about why I wanted to do this, because obviously it's a little bit uh, of a different topic the Burgle Center typically does, but I think that Jerry Brown as governor, first of all, is an incredibly important figure for, for California and therefore for the United States and the world, but also really pioneered a very proactive foreign policy for the state of California uh, in his first two terms to some degree, but especially in his second two terms. Uh, and we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about the way that Jerry Brown in his later years traveled the world as almost a head of state and was treated as such by many people around the world, especially in the Trump era. And I think that's made him kind of a unique governor in many respects. So, um, so that drew me to the book and I really want to recommend the book. Uh, it's fantastic. But obviously there's a lot of depth to the book that goes well beyond the foreign policy dimensions. So with that uh, kind of long intro and uh, out of the way, let me turn things over to Jim. Jim, maybe you could just start us off with some some basics about how you came to write this book. Uh, well, listen, first of all, thank you, Cal. Uh, thank you uh, to the Burkle Center and for all of you uh, for joining us. Um, I really appreciate it. this has been an unusual uh, book tour uh, for me, uh, but <laughs> you're now part of it, so I thank you very much. Um, uh, and so, yeah, let me. I thought I would talk for just a couple minutes about how I came uh, to write this book, uh, and then I'm really eager to take questions from, from, from all of you. Um, uh, I, I was born in California, uh, raised mostly in California. I went to high school up, up north in Palo Alto, um, and then went away for many years, first to college, and then to work for the New York Times and the Atlantic Constitution. Um, throughout, uh, my interest has always been in covering, uh, as a journalist, has always been in covering uh, 
uh, government and politics. Um, I came, uh, I became an editor uh, at the Los Angeles Times in the early 2000s, 2001 or 2002. Uh, and at that point was given responsibility, uh, among other things, for Sacramento coverage. Um, it was the first time that I that my uh, coverage responsibilities had included state government. And uh, I then, uh, I was interested in learning more about the history of governors uh, in California as a result. And uh, my research in that led me quite soon, quite quickly to realize that there wasn't a great biography of Earl Warren, or nothing that I regarded as a great biography of Earl Warren. Um, uh, which at first seemed sort of frustrating and then seemed like kind of an opportunity. Uh, and so I wrote, my first book was a biography of Warren. Um, because Warren grew up in California and was the, the longest serving governor uh, up to that point in the history of California uh, through the early 1950s, uh, my biography of Warren uh, covered kind of California history, roughly speaking, from 1900 to 1950, and then kind of left off because, of course, he left to go to the Supreme Court where he uh, made most of his national impact. Um, but that, uh, but then as I later did, and I did another book with Leon Panetta, um, it was his book, and we can talk more about that later if you'd like, but um, that book uh, allowed me to write about his time in California. He's a congressman from the Monterey area. I still lives there. Um, but I still was eager uh, to kind of wrap up or, or bring to the, into the present uh, the history of California. Um, and Jerry uh, Brown uh, seemed like a logical uh, sort of vehicle uh, by which to explore that history. Um, so this book really attempts to do two things, which is to write a, to frame it as a biography of Brown, which I hope it is, and I hope it's satisfying in that regard, uh, but also to be a history of California from about 1960 to the present. The, uh, the book starts uh, an opening day in Candlestick Park, uh, the first day of baseball was played at Candlestick Park on April 12th of 1960. And though it flashes back a little bit after that to, because Brown was born in 38, to, to sort of bring you up to speed in his early life, uh, it then kind of attempts to cover the history from that point forward. Um, I was encouraged in that, by the way, uh, by uh, Kevin Starr, a great California historian. Uh, he wrote most of the history of California, although this period uh, is largely missing uh, from his, his uh, history of California. Um, I knew Kevin, he was a friend, uh, and I went to him when I was thinking about this project, just frankly to kind of make sure that he wasn't intending to fill in uh, this period in his history. And he told me, no, he wasn't, he wasn't fond of counterculture, and so he had no, no intention of covering this ground. Uh, so he opened the gate for me. Um, so all of that uh, drew me to the book. Um, I, I'll say one more thing about it and then, and then turn it all uh, back over to all of you. But um, the, the real big question then for me is, would he cooperate uh, with this book? Um, and I didn't, I knew Brown a little bit uh, before going to this. I mean, I knew him as governor. He was governor when I was in high school. It sort of feels like he's been governor my whole life. Um, but I didn't know him personally. I'd met him a few times in the context of my work at the LA Times. He'd come in for editorial board meetings and things, and we had chatted. Uh, and I actually was a member of the panel uh, when he debated Neil Kashkari uh, in 2014. So our paths had crossed, but it would be an exaggeration to say that I knew him. Um, so I approached his campaign consultant, A. Smith, up in San Francisco, who I also knew from reporting, um, who kind of referred me on, who liked the idea, uh, but sort of referred me on to Brown's wife, and Gus Brown, uh, also his closest advisor. And she and I discussed it a couple of times before I ever talked about it with Jerry Brown. Um, ultimately, I think once she was persuaded uh, that I was interested in writing an um, objective history of the period and centering it around him, but not being exclusively about him, uh, she recommended it to him, and then he agreed to a bunch of interviews. Um, and so we talked every few months uh, from beginning in 2015 uh, through the end of his fourth term and, and beyond. Um, and uh, we can, again, we can talk more about uh, our relationship uh, as we go today, but um, that became not, not the exclusive, by no means the exclusive source of the book, but he's an, obviously an important, those interviews became an, an important uh, uh, pillar of the book. He also gave me access uh, to some private papers that he hadn't uh, revealed to anyone uh, prior. Um, and, you know, basically in, in many ways our sort of pattern was for me to come with him uh, to talk about events of the day, to talk about history, and then for him to end up talking about whatever he felt like talking about, uh, and me to sort of going along for the ride. So we spent a lot of time together, um, talked about a lot of subjects, and my, my sense of him deepened and in some ways changed 
changed uh, over the course of that. Um, I, the book has a more is more heavily emphasizes his uh, spiritual and kind of intellectual roots and interests, I think, than I would have thought I was doing. That's not something, if you were writing a book, say, about Earl Warren, uh, that would be a direction that would come naturally. Um, but it is so fundamental, I think, to who he is, that the book is less of a traditional political biography and more of a kind of intellectual, spiritual exploration than I expected it to be when I set out. Um, and that's the luxury. That's the the byproduct of the luxury of having had a lot of time uh, with him. And uh, so uh, that's that's how I, that's how this book came to be. Um, it attempts to to tell the story of Jerry Brown and all his contradictions and difficulties and complexities. Um, uh, the uh, the story of a of a the, you know very unusual a political figure who governed twice uh, as in the same job governor uh, twenty eight years apart. So also trying to examine kind of the differences, what, what you can learn by seeing a person at two different stages of his life uh, in such a consequential job, uh, and also to tell the story of California uh, across that same period. So uh, whether it succeeds or not is utterly up to you, but that's, uh, that's what I set out to do. And so back, back to you, Carl. Yeah. Okay, terrific. So um, let me start off first. I obviously can't ignore what's been going on in, in Los Angeles and throughout California, really throughout the world, over the last uh, week uh, in regards to George Floyd and, and kind of policing in general. And I'm curious, I haven't seen Jerry Brown say anything about this, maybe he has, and I'm curious what he, if you know what he has said. Um, but regardless, what do you think he would be doing if he were governor right now? Uh, I have not spoken to him in the last week, uh, nor have I seen him speak publicly. So since this disturbance really took the country uh, by the throat, I have not, I, I don't know what his response has been. I have spoken to him and appeared at some events with him, uh, web uh, events, uh, since the coronavirus uh, ripped the country, uh, so one crisis ago. Um, there, I can say with more confidence, I think, how he's responding. Um, you know, there, uh, I, have not, I have not heard him criticize Gavin Newsom in any respect, so I don't know that there's any difference. I don't know that he would be handling things materially differently than Newsom is. I, I, I do know, and I can say with confidence, that he would be handling things differently than Donald Trump is, um, and certainly he makes that argument. I, um, I think the thing he is, I've heard him be most critical of Trump uh, with regards to coronavirus is a slowness to respond. Uh, to take the lessons of other countries. Um, I've heard him talk about South Korea and Taiwan in particular, um, as countries that had early warnings um, and reacted strongly to them and contained uh, the virus as opposed to what he sees, uh, I would agree, as Trump's uh, haphazard and, and slow response. Um, you know, there, um, I think in many respects, Brown, you don't have to take his word for it that he would respond in that way, that I think his experience with climate change um, is uh, is an indicator of how he would respond to a, a scientific crisis of international proportions, um, and and the way he's describing how he would respond is very much the way he has responded uh, to climate change. Um, as to the current unrest, I really don't know. Uh, I mean, I uh, you know his father was governor during the Watts riots in 1965. Um, Jerry Brown. And was out of office in that long interregnum between his governorships. Um, uh, he was, so he was out of office in 1992 when we experienced the Los Angeles riots. Um, certainly one lesson of the Watts riots that his father learned the hard way is that being out of position and responding slowly has political consequences. His father was in Greece um, when the Watts riots erupted. He was, it was difficult for him to get back um, and he was criticized uh, for uh, a slow response there. Um, you know, Jerry Brown is not just a reaction to his father, and sometimes he takes umbrage uh, at, at the notion that he is, but he did learn uh, from his father's experiences, and so I suspect that he would want to respond quickly. Um, um, you know, this is a different experience than 92. I, I was uh, active in covering the 92 riots, and different in the sense that it's much broader, much more of the country is involved in this unrest. Also different, though, in the sense that Los Angeles, at least, is less, um, it has been less lethal uh, here in LA and less violent. Uh, widespread, uh, prolonged, um, and broader, but maybe not as deep and as violent. So that's uh, what lesson, there are lessons on all sides of that equation, I suspect. And, and all I can tell you for sure is that Brown 
has lived through a lot of that, both directly and through others. And so I suspect that would inform his response to exactly what it would be or how it would compare to Newsom's, though. I, I know less about that than I do with respect to the virus. Great, great, thank you. So let's, let's turn to some of the things you do cover directly in the book that are relevant. You just mentioned climate change, which is an issue that he really did champion early on. But even beyond climate change, one of the signature things about him in, in the first two terms was that he was really ahead of his time in terms of thinking about environmentalism as a political movement. So it existed as you document and many have documented back, back uh, well before he was in office. Mm -hmm. uh, but he really took environmentalism to heart. You talk a bunch in the book about small is beautiful as a kind of uh, mantra that, that both the movement broadly understood believed in, but that Governor Brown really believed in in a kind of personal way. Um, um, with regard to many things, even arguably the University of California. Um, <laughs> he was not one to, uh, you know, you contrasted him to his father. His father grew the university and um, respectfully, Governor Brown seems to sometimes want to um, reduce it or certainly keep it in its, in its uh, lane mm -hmm. and not really, uh, not really offering the kind of funding and support that his father did. So there are some differences there. But, but regardless, with regard to environmentalism, he was someone who was a pathbreaker. And so I guess I'd like to hear you just expand a little about how he saw the environmental movement as a political force and specifically as a kind of Californian issue. What was Californian about it? Yeah, those are a lot, a lot of big questions wrapped up uh, in there and good ones. Um, uh, yes, to, yes, I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, there's more to it than that. Um, uh, he was an early, um, he recognized early uh, the dimensions of, of the environmental movement. Um, uh, you know, some people, I think somewhat incorrectly, but date one of the one of the milestone moments in that movement is the, is the Santa Barbara oil spill. As some people call it the beginning of the environmental movement. I'm not sure that's true, but it's important. Um, and one of the interesting things when one looks back on that period and compares it to today is there was not really significant partisan dis difference of opinion uh, with respect to it. There were clearly d individual politicians who took different views of environmental issues, but it wasn't a cleavage issue in the way that it is today. Um, Brown's environmentalism uh, goes back at least that far. Um, he, uh, the objects of that environmental concern early on, or have changed over the years. Um, you know, coastal protection, uh, air pollution, uh, you know, acid rain, smog, those were the issues that dominated the 1970s. And by the way, uh, the Air Resources Board here in California was actually born under Ronald Reagan, an early remi or a reminder early on that these were less divisive issues. Um, uh, one of Brown's signature important uh, accomplishments in that early era was to put Mary Nichols uh, on the Air Resources Board. Uh, she's been what, one of our UCLA colleagues. There you go. Uh, and um, and you know, arguably the person who has done more to clean air in this country than any other person ever. Um, uh, and she enjoys uh, enjoyed that position enjoys it today, uh, largely because Brown identified her early on. Um, now, by the second terms, which is to say the third and fourth term, uh, the focus of in his environmental concerns had shifted, uh, not shifted, but had evolved into climate change. Um, and there, uh, I, again, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, also uh, achieved some important milestones with respect to climate change, um, AB 32, which is the greenhouse gas initiative in California that provides the framework for much of this is a, was signed by Schwarzenegger. Um, but Jerry Brown uh, guided California through the environment, you know, the economic collapse at the end of the night or at the end of the 2000s, 2000, 2009, came back to office in 2011, back to economic health while also managing and imposing some of the most uh, stringent environmental uh, restrictions, climate change uh, goals and, uh, and restrictions of any state in the country. So not only is his a kind of rhetorical uh, leadership of the environmental movement, but it's practical leadership of it with respect to climate change and, and proving to any remaining doubters that the the one does not have to choose between economic health and environmental protection, but that there is a viable way to achieve both. Um, I mean, it's within my life as a reporter that that, that was an ex accepted wisdom that one had to choose. Um, and so I, I think that anyone who clings to that today really has to reckon with the fact that California has proved otherwise. Um, and I think Brown deserves the lion's share of the credit for that. So that's, 
Um, now, there is another way to talk about him in the environment, and I won't go on and on here, but, and that is as an outgrowth of his spiritual upbringing and his experience with the Jesuits, his experience with Zen Buddhism. Um, there is a, uh, a humility uh, that comes in, in when in confronting environmental issues that has to do, in his mind, I think, and, and fascinatingly, with the confrontation of a, with an absolute, uh, that it's not an argument in the same way that some arguments in politics are. In fact, one of the most uh, interesting political things that I have heard him say, and that, that's a long list of those, um, is when Donald Trump dismissed climate change, uh, his, his response to that was to say that it was proof that Trump lacked a, su a sufficient fear of God. Um, that, to me, is a nice... Uh, merger of the spiritual and the political and Brown. And the environment is more than any other issue, along with criminal justice maybe, but I would say even more than that in some ways, the place where one sees his, uh, his spiritual exploration expressed as a political set of priorities. So interesting. It really makes him an unusual fate. I mean, he's, he's unusual in so many ways, uh, but that's one of the really distinguishing things about him. Agreed. Do you think, just to stick with climate and kind of the environment for a moment, uh, when he, in, the, in say his fourth term in particular, I think, but maybe even in his third, when he would go abroad, he would be received as essentially a head of state and be, be treated, I mean, granted, California is the fifth largest economy in the world. We ought to be, I would submit, uh, a nation state. We'd probably be better off if we were. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, he was treated that way by many people around the world, many foreign leaders. Uh, and he seemed, from my casual observation, happy to play that role. And so I'm curious why you think he was so successful on the global stage, not just here in California. What made him attractive? I mean, there's some obvious, yeah. but what, what do you think made him attractive? Yeah, no, I think that's a, uh, it's an excellent question. I, um, I, the first and foremost, I think what you've already said, which is that he represented this enormous entity, even within the context of the United States, such an enormous part of the United States, and as you said, the fifth largest economy in the world. California is about the size of Britain um, when it comes to economic when it comes to economic activity. So uh, he's, in many ways, I think, was received as if he were a prime minister of Britain. Um, uh, that is, uh, I think, then even compounded further by a couple other things. One is his longevity. Um, you know, he talks about meeting with, you know, leaders in China whose parents he knew. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's, his relationships are very, very deep and very long uh, with a lot of these, a lot of the countries with which the United States or the California interacts. Um, uh, and then uh, other things, the novelty of him. I think he's been, he's interesting to people uh, all over the world. Um, I mean, you know, even things that, that may seem trivial, but that nevertheless make him interesting his relationship with Linda Ronstadt, his, uh, you know, his uh, identification with the kind of youth movements of the 1970s and 60s. Uh, some of that is he's correctly identified with and some not, but he comes out of a period in which California uh, uh, is fascinating to people. So I think all of that makes him interesting abroad, uh, makes him fascinating. Um, and then finally, particularly with respect to climate change, uh, is the fact that he, he can make an argument that he's done more than any elected official anywhere uh, to really address climate change within the within the limits that a, that a state can do so. Um, and actually, I said finally, but I'll add one more, which is that in the last two years of his administration, it's juxtaposed against Trump. Um, and so to have the leader of the largest unit of the United States pushing in one direction on climate change while the leader of the overall United States is pushing in the other, I think for a world that's looking for leadership and looking for American leadership on climate change, Brown became in effect that leader uh, because Trump abdicated that role uh, so egregiously. Yes, no, agreed. And I think one of the interesting things as some of the viewers probably know, California has been active. Brown, I think initiated this though, parts of it may go back further to Schwarzenegger and others uh, in, partnering with foreign jurisdictions, Quebec and other places for a cap and trade system, mm -hmm. system under AB 32. That's being challenged in the courts right now by the Trump administration, uh, kind of a somewhat arcane but really interesting constitutional question about what states like California can do uh, mm -hmm. on the international stage. But without question, Brown pushed it uh, to, to whatever limit there is, I think he pushed it there. He also, I think what, what I really liked about what you just said is he, to me, represented sort of personified California's soft power. And one of the things that made California such a, 
a place of interest to people around the world from let's say the mid 60s onward was the dynamism, the creativity, the weirdness of California. California was a place that was incredibly creative, not just in the conventional way of Hollywood, but you know, we invented the internet. We invent, you know, you can go on and on with the things that we invented. Uh, and Jerry Brown with his um, unusual life really kind of embodied that soft power. Uh, and I think that continues today. I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think interestingly, there are times in his life where that has worked against him politically and times when that's worked for him. Um, I mean, like in his presidential campaigns. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, okay. I hate to even, uh, even uh, raise it, but it's always out there, which is Moonbeam, right? Governor Moonbeam. Um, what is, what does governor Moonbeam mean? And why did that stick with him? Well, can, can, I think, can I pause for a second? Can you tell the story about the reporter or the columnist who yeah. pointed out? And that was yeah, a that's, good, that's a good, I'm sorry, good place to start this story. Uh, Mike Royko uh, was a columnist in Chicago, very successful uh, newspaper columnist. Um, and uh, Royko wrote a, a column that he later disavowed, uh, but he wrote a several columns actually um, back in the 1970s. Um, uh, it's actually like 7980, um, in which he uh, uh, labeled Brown Governor Moon. Um, they were part of a larger kind of glib columnist dismissal of California as a whole, as just a, as a wacky place where, you know, no good came out of this sort of kooky left wing, you know, left coast kind of place. That was the tone of the columns. Um, um, and they were vastly unfair to Jerry Brown then, and even less fair uh, to him today. Um, but they are part of a, a, a sort of East Coast, Midwest view of California in the 1970s that it was kooky, uh, weird, as you say, I think accurately. Um, and Brown is utterly identified appropriately with California. And so to some extent, as California went, so did Brown and vice versa. Um, uh, now, over time, a lot of what was being talked about then looks less kooky and more prescient. Uh, I mean, the notion that someone looks back and sees the advocacy of solar energy, for instance, as kooky is, right. is sort of ridiculous now, right? I mean, the things that, that went into Moonbeam, solar energy, smart buildings, uh, satellite technology, also the fact that he was unmarried and dating a celebrity, to, that all kind of wraps into this idea of Moonbeam. A lot of that's been vindicated by time. Um, and so, uh, as I say, I don't think it was fair even in the instant, um, and Royko himself came to regret it. Um, but it, the reason it stuck and has, ha has haunted Brown, I think, to this day, is that it did capture a kind of feeling not just about him, but about California. And that, that feeling has changed a lot over time. A lot of what seemed fringe now seems uh, foreshadowing um, and, and uh, forward-looking. Um, and, and Brown, similarly, I think, much of what seemed uh, kind of uh, wacky uh, in the 1970s now seems. Yeah, I would even add his uh, championing of diversity in the California government, on the courts, et cetera. Yeah. That was not unique to him, but he pushed it arguably further than any other political figure of his time in his first two terms and continued that. And again, uh -huh. has, has been vindicated. Let me ask about another topic that he really uh, had a great interest in and has kind of international dimensions, but also domestic dimensions, which is nuclear. Uh, power and weapons and just kind of the whole question of what does the nuclear revolution mean? And Brown's one of, you know, he's one of the older politicians uh, around, lived through, uh, you know, the dropping of the bombs uh, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if he remembers, but, you know, he was, he was uh, you know, old enough to remember, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, from an early stage in his career, took a real interest uh, in a topic that uh, many people today simply ignore. Um, so tell us a little bit about why that was a big deal for him and what, you know, kind of what his stance was. Yes, well, um, Brown, as you say, uh, is old enough to have lived through the actual use of the bombs. He remembers the end of the war. I don't know that he remembers, or at least in my conversation with him, I don't recall him talking about the bombs themselves being dropped, but he remembers the war ending. So he was born in 38. Um, he, um, uh, he was involved in the anti-war movement. Um, and so I think early on, uh, found it quite natural uh, to question uh, the place of nuclear weapons in the American overall military uh, strategy. Um, he was a critic of the 
the use or the participation of the of the UC system, and particularly the Lawrence Livermore Lab, uh, in the development and refining of nuclear weapons. Um, Can we say a word about that? Just because I know I know we have a lot of UCLA viewers, and we're both UCLA people, uh, and I'm sure there's many UC alums listening and watching. Just say a word about that relationship because I think people don't always appreciate the. Yeah, it was. I mean, the the complicated part of that, of course, is that the lab performs work for the Department of Energy um, in connection with weapons, and the lab does other things as well. And so, Brown, there was a movement. Um, uh, Daniel Ellsberg and others uh, were involved uh, in a movement while Brown was governor in the first two terms to try to end weapons research at Lawrence Livermore. The, the complicated aspect of that is that the UC system had some dominion over that, but not over the Department of Energy's work itself. And so Brown led a kind of half-hearted and ultimately ineffective attempt to sever uh, the, the university from the weapons. Uh, in his first uh, round as governor. Incorrect, in his, uh, in his second term, I believe. So the, in his first round as governor, yes. Um, uh, it, did the, it came to a vote of the regions, it failed. Um, uh, it was not, it's not exactly clear to me anyway, nor, nor am I sure it's clear to him, what would have happened had that vote succeeded. Um, but it was at a minimum a, uh, an expression of unhappiness that the UC system was in some way supportive of this weapons research. Um, uh, and so at least as a, uh, as a matter of symbolic debate, it, it was an important question uh, that was debated, that was confronted in those years. Um, he came up short in terms of the actual votes, but it was an avenue for him expressing his, his unhappiness uh, with the university and therefore the states involvement in weapons research. He, he came a little more slowly uh, and with a little more uh, nuance and complexity to the question of, uh, of uh, non-weapons uh, use of nuclear, or nuclear energy, is, which is to say nuclear energy. Um, there he had, you know, uh, for instance, at the Diablo Canyon protest, which occurred mm -hmm. again in his first tour as governor, he had to do the complicated thing of being both a protester and also the governor. Um, who had responsibilities to ensure the protection of these plants. Um, he didn't actually have licensing authority over them. That's a, it's a federal nuclear regulatory commission responsibility. But when there were the protests at Diablo Canyon, for instance, there was the question of uh, how to handle the protesters. Well, how to handle them. Not unlike what we're talking about today, right? Um, whether to arrest people. Um, if so, uh, how to incarcerate them. Who should be responsible? So he was both uh, a speaker at the uh, Diablo Canyon protests, and also the governor who oversaw the arrests of people at the Diablo Canyon protests. Amazing. Uh, that's, that's complicated. Um, and as a result, he sort of walked a line that maybe didn't totally please either side uh, in that very uh, complicated debate. Um, he has remained a, um, in, in later years, he's focused much more energy on nuclear weapons as opposed to nuclear power. Um, there, uh, he was animated in part uh, by Bill Perry, uh, wrote a, l a really lovely and, and quite uh, shocking in some ways uh, examination of the state of nuclear weapons and the threat of nuclear annihilation post-Cold War. Um, Brown read it in manuscript form to Perry, uh, I guess Perry or someone uh, associated with Perry sent it to Brown. Uh, he read it and, you know, Brown is very fond of the, the warning shot. Uh, I mean, he's very attentive to those who sound an alarm that other people aren't listening to. Um, and in this case, Perry's book really got under his skin. Um, he actually called up the editor of the New York Review of Books and, uh, and sort of demanded that they review it and they responded appropriately by asking him to review it, which he did. Um, uh, and he and Perry uh, remain close um, and in contact. Um, uh, Brown is very concerned with the notion of a nuclear accident in particular and, the, and very concerned uh, about cutting, cutting back weapons agreements and communications in such a way that an accident could escalate in his view. Um, he, like Perry, has come to the conclusion that the dangers of nuclear war may actually have grown in the post-Cold War era, not subsided. Um, so of the things that he's now uh, very involved in post-governorship, um, the three things that really uh, seem to animate him the most now are criminal justice reform, nuclear weapons, and climate change. Um, and uh, he is a, 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 has, he's a senior position with the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Uh, he speaks out frequently on nuclear weapons. And this has become a, 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 a it has been an issue for him as long as, I can go back with him, but it has become even more so, I think, in recent years. <clears throat>
Interesting. Well, I had the honor, the very first year I was director of the Berkeley Center, we had Bill Perry to campus mm -hmm. to speak. He did fantastic and yeah. very prescient on these things. And what's interesting about Brown is he does seem to have a very finely tuned set of antenna for the kind of cataclysmic long-term issues that politicians simply ignore because, or, or typically ignore, because they're so far in the future and so abstract, I think most people have a hard time grasping them. And can, I think, uh, fortunately, climate change has become something, maybe it's unfortunate, uh, that people feel it's less far in the future. Uh, and we're seeing a little bit more movement, uh, certainly here in this state, we have seen movement, but not nearly enough. So I really applaud him for, for doing that. Um, so let me let me just ask about a couple of other uh, things, and then we'll turn to. We have a lot of really great questions. Um, so I guess one you know one question is how he you compare in the book this is this sort of shift out of the foreign policy realm for a moment. You compare in the book his his first tour and his second tour, and then uh, as governor, and then in in the middle, he's also a mayor. And so give us a little flavor of how being a mayor changed his style of governing, if you think it did change it. Yeah. Or do you think his, his different approach in a second tour was simply the result of being older and wiser? Um, well, listen, uh, let me start by saying, when I started this book, uh, one of the things, many of the things I ended up saying in the book are not things that I set out to say, uh, that I learned along the way. But one thing I knew that, I, that was interesting and important to address was this question of comparing the two governorships. Um, as I said earlier, I was a high school student when he was governor the first time, so I have memories of that, but not as a reporter. And then, of course, I, I watched uh, very close the third and fourth terms. Uh, and it's often and correctly observed that he was quite different uh, in those two sets of terms. Um, uh, let me more focused, more uh, uh, effective, I think, in certain ways at uh, identifying and addressing problems and actually uh, solving them uh, in the third and fourth terms. The first two terms, I think, uh, fondly remembered by some and <laughs> not so fondly by others as more chaotic, as more experimental, um, as him really rattling the cages uh, of California government and, and by extension, uh, national issues. Um, but more as a provocateur, I think, and less as a practitioner. Um, uh, so then the question th that you uh, rightly pose is sort of what changed? Um, He's 36 years old when he became governor of California. He was 80 years old when he stopped being governor of California. Um, that in and of itself is part of the change. He is, as he likes to say, he didn't value experience until he had experience and then he realized how valuable it was. Um, so some of it is getting older and living longer. Um, uh, but I think two events uh, of that inter interregnum period uh, really stand out as uh, transformative for him. And one is being mayor of Oakland. Um, you know, Jerry Brown was not a local official before he was governor. Um, he was a, a briefly a community college board member in Los Angeles, and then he was secretary of state, and then suddenly at age 36, he was governor. Um, so he had never done the work of a mayor uh, or a, a council member or a county supervisor. Um, for him, government, I think, in the first iteration, the first governorship, was therefore more about clashes of interests, as, as he said and I used in the book. It's about labor versus environmentalists, or it's about, uh, you know, the, the military or, you know, the, the prison guards versus uh, you know, uh, criminal justice reformers. Um, it wasn't really about people in their lives. It was more about these abstract uh, abstractions and conflicts. Um, as mayor, you know, the, it's about getting a Whole Foods into downtown Oakland. It's about building housing units, and it's about it's not environmentalism as an ism now. It's about, you know, if somebody wants to build a deck on their property overlooking a lake, what does that do to people who enjoy the lake? Uh, and so some of, you know, I, Jerry Brown in many ways, I think one of the odd arcs of his life is that he goes from abstraction toward a more concrete life, whereas most of us go the other direction. Um, and part of that, I think, in his political development was being, being mayor and seeing the actual implications of policy and actually in the lives of people. Uh, I, and then he brings that experience back with him in the second governorship. And I think it's a big part of why he's more effective. The other one on a more personal level is that he got married. Um, that uh, Ann Gus Brown, uh, his uh, really uh, extraordinarily uh, intelligent and capable um, and also just really dear person, um, 
uh, I, two things I would say about his marriage. One is it says something very positive about him that he recognized all those qualities in Anne Guest. That it shows a kind of connection on a on an individual level that was more abstract to him. I think in the, in his earlier years. Um, and the other uh, is that she, that he listens to her, that um, that he really does rely on her, and has come to trust another person um, in a way that I'm not sure. I mean, he had lots of advisors and lots of people he talked to in those early terms, but I don't know that he had that kind of um, you know really uh, concrete um, uh, 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 reliance on another person in those earlier terms. So all of that I think goes into making him a much a much more effective governor the second time and a mayor. Mayoral is a big part of that. Mm. Great, great. Okay, so we have a lot of terrific questions from uh, viewers. So let me go to them. Um, apologies to those of you whose questions I won't get to, but uh, some some are um, uh, some are just really compelling and some are doubles and some will just run out of time. But let me start off with a brief one, which really hits on a hot button issue we didn't discuss, but you do spend a lot of time in the book talking about. And the question is, how does Jerry feel now about his support for Prop 13? Mm. Now, we might query, did he support Prop 13 really? And so um, maybe answer that as well. Yeah, uh, he did not support Prop 13. Um, so that's part of the answer. Um, uh, he opposed Prop 13, um, but that is not to absolve him altogether. Um, he, um, he opposed Prop 13. He, he and the legislature, once the momentum behind Prop 13 was gaining, and therefore too late in retrospect, passed an alternative tax relief measure that appeared on the ballot as well. Um, I think it was the obvious even at the time, and certainly more so in retrospect, that it was kind of too little and too late. Um, there's another way in which Brown, I think, contributed to the energy behind Prop 13, and this is a little bit being punished for a good deed, but is that he ran a big state surplus, as he did in his fourth term. Um, and for those who felt overtaxed and who felt buffeted by it, uh, the threat of being taxed out of their homes, particularly older people, the notion that they would be paying what they regarded as uh, unfairly high taxes at the same time that the state was running a surplus, uh, uh, added uh, to their anxiety and their anger. So all of that, I think, caused Brown both to underestimate and in, in some ways, at least indirectly, to contribute to the momentum behind Prop 13. He opposed it um, and he was warned that it might pass and he didn't take it seriously and then it did. Uh, once it passed, and this is probably what the question is referring to, he very quickly embraced it. Um, now there he got a lot of criticism too, the criticism there, I think, is a little less fair of him. Um, he's governor of California, and the people of California had just approved Prop 13. I don't know that he really had a practical alternative other than to implement it. Um, um, the way he implemented it at least temporarily blunted some of the negative aspects of Prop 13. Essentially, he spent the surplus on trying to make up the difference that Prop 13 created. Now, again, you can criticize him for that. That delayed some of the political reckoning uh, with the seriousness of Prop 13. To have allowed that reckoning to come sooner and inflicted that pain earlier while sitting on a surplus, I suspect would have created its own criticism of him, justified. So I'm, I'm a little less critical than some people, I think, of his handling post-Prop 13. Um, uh, you know, he described himself as a born-again tax cutter. And so for political purposes, he kind of wrapped himself around it going forward. And that, one can be offended by that. Um, he... Uh, but I think, the, for in my view, the more serious uh, offense that he committed related to Prop 13 is his underestimation of it going in. Um, he probably, he, he and the legislature had been more attentive to the anxieties in the state that led to Prop 13 and had acted more forcefully and earlier to head them off, we might have escaped that problem. And he didn't do that. Great, great. So another question is uh, related to where we began. But uh, I think you can kind of go in at some some different directions. So the question is, what would uh, Jerry Brown's advice be to Gavin Newsom in the current social crisis gripping California, but also the political crisis in the face of White House animosity towards California? So one of the things that's interesting uh, is we really do have this kind of resistance uh, mentality to some degree in California vis-a-vis -vis the Trump administration, um, but uh, that's reflected right back at us. Uh, and that's um, something we haven't seen uh, in the history of California quite as much before. So, um, so I guess I would make a friendly amendment. Do you think that's a good thing? In other words, are we doing the right thing uh, by kind of having this oppositional pose? And, and then back to the question, what yeah. do you tell Gavin? 
Um, well, one of my one of my favorite photographs in the book um, is that there's a photograph you all will recall that uh, uh, President Trump visited California in the wake of the Paradise fires, which he weirdly referred to as the pleasure uh, the city and pleasure. Uh, but Brown and Newsom accompanied him uncomfortably on his tour of the fire area. And there's a great picture in the book of Newsom and his windbreaker sort of uh, with Trump and Brown almost visibly biting his tongue. Um, uh, and uh, between those people, not Trump, but the others, I was able to piece together their day on the shuttling around the fire zones, California, there's fires in Southern California too. Um, incredibly uncomfortable experience with, you know, Trump telling Brown that he needed to listen to environmentalists who said to let the, you know, to dam up the rivers. And the idea that Donald Trump, a real estate developer and golf course owner, would lecture Jerry Brown and Gavin Newsom about the environmentalists is just, it hurts your ears to hear. Um, uh, but Brown did take the view that, well, while he didn't always hew to this view, he did take the view that, that he shouldn't engage in political rancor with Trump just for the sake of it, that he had to keep the interests of California in mind. And if insulting Donald Trump meant that it would deny services or benefits to Californians, that he should hold his time. Now, he didn't always do that uh, because it was hard to. Um, and, you know, um, on this day that, that Newsom and he were touring with Trump, in Newsom's case, Newsom was governor-elect at that point, It's the animus is strained even further by the fact that Newsom's ex wife is dating Trump's son. Um, so there's a level on a personal level, this is just freaking horrible. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's just hard to imagine. Um, you know, I mean, Brown, for the most part, of tried to avoid kind of head to head confrontations with Trump during those, those two years. He didn't always do that. Uh, he was, I happened to be with him uh, the day after the Trump administration filed a lawsuit against California challenging its sanctuary policies on immigration. Brown was furious, uh, less so publicly. He was furious with me, again, with the understanding that my material was going to the book uh, and therefore wasn't coming out the next day. Um, but, you know, he felt both the Jeff Sessions then the Attorney General was wrong on the substance, that he misrepresented California's sanctuary policy, and also that it was just uh, bad form for him to come to Sacramento and file a lawsuit and not even tell uh, the leadership here that he was doing any of that. Brown was outraged. Um, uh, and then, of course, Brown's, he just could not stomach uh, Trump on climate change. And there are a couple times when he just couldn't hold that in. Um, and I don't blame him, to tell you the truth. But uh, but uh, I do think it's governors are governors first and political figures second. Um, and there is an obligation on someone like Newsom or Brown to secure benefits for Californians, even if that means occasionally having to hold their tongue. Um, that I certainly have seen that at work with Newsom and the coronavirus, uh, where he seems right. on occasion to have gone out of his way to express his appreciation for the Trump administration. Uh, I'm fairly confident that's not out of any personal appreciation for Donald Trump, uh, but out of a, a sense of obligation to California residents. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, next question, so this is the, this is the, the questioner writing. Um, uh, he writes, I've always been impressed with Governor Brown's focus on fiscal austerity, balanced budgets, excessive debt, et cetera. You talk a lot about this in the book. Uh, this is really a through line. Uh, and the writer goes on, he's unique among progressives for his concern with these issues. Um, Republicans have generally left them behind. Democrats never seem to care much. Um, how would he view this time and what would be his prognosis for the future? So uh, I'd say there's as much of a comment as a question in that, but but it's a great opportunity to talk about the fact that he was even personally a believer in austerity. He, he lived a relatively austere life. You talk in the book about how Pat Brown uh, sort of cashed in, uh, one might say at the end, um, after being governor. And, um, you know, Jerry does not seem to be doing that in the way that his father did. And um, as far as I know, he's not, uh, doesn't seem to be his personal style. And so Jerry Brown is somewhat unique uh, in terms of his, his appreciation and even, I might say, kind of fascination with austerity. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, a lot of good information wrapped up uh, in that question, too. Um, uh, well, a couple of things. First of all, I would say this is a good example of where Jerry Brown did not follow after his father, either as a governor or really as a person. Um, uh, it's often said uh, that Jerry reminds many people more of his mother than his father. Sometimes that's correct, and sometimes it isn't. I think he looks more like his mom, so that sort of starts from that. Um, but um, one way in which he very much is more his mother's son than his father's is that he's cheap. 
Um, he, uh, she was a coupon clipper and uh, she was careful with the budget. And uh, you know, Jerry Brown can tell you how much he spent for lunch uh, today, I'm sure. Um, uh, Willie well, Brown. According to your book, you hardly ever spend any money on lunch. He, was, he would, was famous for not having money in it, not carrying a wallet, not having money in his pocket as governor. Willie Brown, um, you know, longstanding governor or uh, mayor of San Francisco and also a speaker of the, uh, the assembly. Uh, I interviewed Willie Brown early in this process and I, I remember saying to him at one point, you know, just describe your relationship with them. Are you friends? Are you business colleagues? I mean, how do you, how would you describe your your connection to Jerry Brown? And he said, no, no, we're friends. And when, you know, we'll often have dinner in the city or, or do this or that. And he goes, but I'll tell you, boy, one time, just one time, I'd love to see him pick up a check. Um, and, and, you know, uh, Jerry Brown doesn't think that story is as funny as I do, by the way. But um, in any case, uh, uh, he is, and he'll say, he'll say, yeah, I'm not really a fiscal conservative. I'm really cheap. Uh, I mean, he's very frugal. Um, uh, and yes, to, to the questioner, uh, that does set him apart from a lot of progressives. These days, it also sets him apart from Republicans. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know that there's a, that there well, is but a- to the questioner's credit, he, he, I'm sorry? Sorry, to the questioner's credit, he mentioned that, that Republicans yeah. uh, have abandoned that as, a, wow. as an important point. I mean, there's really, is there a deficit hawk left in Washington? I don't really know. Uh, I, if so, it escaped me. I mean, but, um, but Brown is. I mean, Brown really, he, he supported the balanced budget amendment back in the 90s when that was popular. Um, he, uh, he balanced, you know, 16 California state budgets. I mean, there's some play in that budget and pensions are a different conversation. And so it's not, he's not addressed all uh, issues of deficit spending, but he has, you know, he took a 26, $28 billion budget shortfall that Schwarzenegger left in his final year. And left with about a twenty billion dollar surplus, so that's about a you know a fifty billion dollar turnaround in California's finances. That's astonishing, um, and that's not an accident. Uh, that is also that partly that is a, was a willingness to support increased taxes, um, but it also just as importantly was a willingness to say no to spending. Um, and I, I, you know I've covered politics a long time, and most one thing that most politicians have in common is a kind of reluctance and unwillingness or a desire not to say no to people. It's obviously better politics to say yes. Jerry Brown not only is capable of saying no, but I think he kind of likes uh, saying no. Uh, that, that comes very naturally to him. And you mentioned the UC system earlier. That's a place where sometimes saying no uh, wasn't always wise, I think. Um, but uh, he is willing to say no to spending and has done so. Um, and and that is definitely a hallmark of his life in politics and initially distinguished him from progressive Democrats today distinguishes him from just about everyone. Agreed. Agreed. So we're almost out of time. So what I'm going to do is kind of uh, take two questions and kind of mash them up because they both relate to Biden. Um, so one is uh, one is a little more complicated, one simpler. Uh, so one is when Brown was running for election in 2010, one of his campaign messages was that he'd solved the partisan gridlock that paralyzed California. And by many accounts, he did do that successfully. Um, you talk about that in the book. Um, you can opine on that part. Um, and then the question is, are there any lessons here for Biden, given he's going to face even more drastic uh, levels of, um, of animosity amongst the parties? And then there's another questioner who, who asks, uh, would Brown accept a position in a Biden administration? <laughs> So what position? So uh, take your pick amongst those. Uh, yeah, well, as to the divide, um, uh, yes, Brown was successful in overcoming the divide, sometimes by, and, and he did uh, on some key votes recruit some Republican support. Um, I mean, the divide is very different in California than it is, though, in Washington, where it were essentially a 50-50 divide uh, that divides Washington. In California, the Republican Party is so marginal at this point that while it helped Brown on occasion to pick off a few Republican votes and to be able to show bipartisanship behind cap and trade, for instance, um, that governing in California is possible only with the slightest bit of participation with the Republican Party. That's not the case in Washington. So I think Biden's challenge, uh, if he's elected, is much uh, more difficult in that sense than Trump, than, uh, than, uh, than Brown's. Um, Jim, can I, can I interject on that point? Yeah, Do you please. believe, you know, one, one read that I personally subscribe to is that if you went back in California history, as you know, that wasn't always the case. Republicans were governors for many, many years. Then along came Prop 187, uh, very much similar to what Trump had done. Pete Wilson kind of uh, demonized immigrants and 
and basically the end of the Republican Party followed suit as the Latino vote grew and, and he really alienated a lot of moderates. And now we have a, a shrunken sort of rump Republican Party, hardly a power force anymore uh, in a state where it used to really uh, dominate. Um, do you think that that's the playbook that's going to unfold over the next decade? Uh, I, I, I mean, this is one of those areas in which California is the vision of the future, uh, for sure. I don't, but that future is not going to catch up with the country in time for Joe Biden, I don't think. Uh, no, this uh, is yeah, a problem. But, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, the cycle in which white votes are dominant is true now. We're still in that cycle, and we may be in it for one or two more. But it, it's that, that historical demography of the electorate is changing for the nation as it already has changed for California. So that stuff, I, I agree, that catches up with the country eventually. I don't think it, it will uh, address this divide in time for it to benefit Biden. Um, but I think that is the long arc of history on this. Um, and, you know, Brown, Brown could have chosen to govern as purely a Democrat. There are issues where it would have been more popular for him to be more liberal than he was. Um, he chose not to because that's who, not who he is, I think. Uh, and, so, and he had the luxury of not needing to uh, and of being good at recruiting votes across the aisle when he needed to. Um, uh, the second question, would he accept a position in the Trump or in the, no, not in the Trump administration, in the Biden administration? Uh, I don't know. Uh, you, you know I mean, he, that's a question better posed to him than me. Um, I kind of doubt it, I guess, would be my the way I would respond. He's 82 years old now. Um, uh, he's got... Uh, in politics is to be in your 80s, so... Um, he and, doesn't seem you know, he's doing good work. He's doing work he enjoys. He's living up in Calusa. Um, uh, I, I have a hard time imagining him at this point in his life uprooting it for Washington. I have a hard time imagining and uh, supporting that too. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's led an unconventional life. I mean, my big, I, when I was writing this book, it was, it, it started from the premise that this would be the first book to capture Jerry Brown's entire public life, right? And so it's in my interest that he not have another chapter of public life. But my, my biggest concern, frankly, was not that he would go off and join the administration, but that he would run for city council in Colusa, you know, or in Williams. Because uh, he's, you never know. I mean, his arc has been so unconventional, he might have one more chapter in public life. Right. I doubt that it would be in a Biden administration, but I honestly don't know. If, uh, I agree. I think it's unlikely, uh, maybe even crazy. But if he did, what would, uh, what would he want to be? I would think it would be something in the environmental arena. Uh, I mean, uh, whether that would take him to Interior or EPA or whatnot, I don't know. I mean, that I, of all the things that animate him in every conversation, the environment is the through line. Um, so I, I assume if something appealed to him, it would be in that area. Great, great. Well, Jim, thank you so much for uh, coming on, talking about the book. Maybe hold, hold it up for, uh, oh, yeah. for the viewers. i got a copy right here. <laughs> Fantastic right. book. Uh, I really recommend it again, Jim. Thank you so much for, uh, for doing this. And thank you, everyone, for listening and, and watching. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.